Hey everyone, I'm Dan Scheinman, Vice President of Audubon Society of Central Arkansas. Welcome to our monthly meeting. The, this month I have the pleasure of introducing two students from Hendricks College. We have um, Keen Salmon. He's a senior biology major at Hendricks. His interests include ecology, conservation, marine biology, and ornithology. Following graduation, he plans to attend graduate school to further study conservation biology and ornithology. And also tag teaming with Keen is Ariane Podell. She's a senior, in, a senior neuroscience major at Hendricks. Her main interests include research in ethology and animal cognition, conservation and wildlife rehabilitation. After graduation, she plans to attend grad school to further study cognitive ethology. And that would be a good question. What is cognitive ethology? Both students are researching under the guidance of Dr. Maureen McClung, who's an associate professor of biology at Hendricks. So take it away, Keen and Ariane. All right, well, uh, thank you so much, Audubon Society, for hosting us this evening. Um, We'll wait another moment to get the um, presentation shared. I'll get that going right now. Come on. Okay. All right, so we are excited to talk to you guys about our research, which we have conducted in collaboration with our fellow students, Victoria Haran and Emerson Lejong, our research supervisor, Maureen McClung, and partners at Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, uh, Kirsten Bartlow, Chris Madaw, and Kim Sparks. In this talk, we will share an overview of the Central Arkansas Urban Wildlife Project and some examples of research questions that can be explored with the data we are collecting. So the world is having an explosion in urban growth right now. At the moment, more than half of the world's human population lives in urban areas. And it is estimated that by 2030, more than 1.2 billion people will have moved into cities. Uh, those cities attract people because of job opportunities and increased industrialization. Urban areas have a direct impact on the loss of biodiversity. Uh, urbanization usually comes at the expense of degrading the environment. The, imp the impacts of urbanization are also made worse by the fact that much of the urbanization happens in areas of biodiversity significance, such as coastal zones. The indirect effects of urbanization on biodiversity loss are much greater than the direct impacts. A primary cause for biodiversity loss is the destruction of habitats due to obtaining resources and food for consumption in cities. Also, uh, climate change is another primary driver for biodiversity loss, and urban areas are responsible for more than 75% of global CO2 emissions. Though an area may become urbanized, it still often hosts green spaces. When thinking about urban green spaces, a lot of things might come to mind. These vary considerably based on the urban area in question, as well as the uses of the green space. We can consider spaces like Central Park in New York City, which is massive yet completely is surrounded by elements of Manhattan. Or we could talk about playgrounds and city parks, golf courses, or places like state and national parks that exist in cities. These can be used by humans for a lot of things from taking children to play, hiking, cycling, or dog walking. Uh, urban green spaces are often important development invest investments by cities that can help to improve the citizens' mental and physical health, but humans are not the only ones that use these spaces. Um. Uh, in recent years, awareness of use by wildlife of urban green spaces has increased. As human, as human civilization takes over increasing amounts of land, 
the interactions between wildlife and humans become much more evident and important in the day-to-day -day lives of humans. Uh, we know that there are a lot of factors that lead to being able to make inferences about wildlife. As shown in this graphic cre created by uh, Magel and collaborators, we can see that occupancy and abundance of wildlife depends on various things based on the scale at which we are examining. But within cities, we can look at variables such as patch size, green space type, human activity, housing density, socioeconomics, and species interactions. While we know that these variables can have an effect on urban wildlife occupancy and abundance, there is still a lot left to discover. Uh, this poses an interesting opportunity for a collaboration between wildlife scientists, social scientists, city planners, management experts, and community members of urban spaces. So where did this whole thing kind of start? So it starts with the idea that there's still a lot to understand about urban wildlife. So the Lincoln Park Zoo created the Urban Wildlife Information Network, which really in its essence strives to understand urban species from uh, ecological and behavioral perspectives. This project launched originally in Chicago, but now there's actually more than 20 cities that have instituted a study that follows this same method. One of the first I recently just found out is actually my hometown of Austin, Texas, um, that you can see, you know, down towards the bottom. Um, this, you know, centralization of all of these uh, of all of these methods has really been standardized to monitor the wildlife, and you know, we've been able to use this data for education, outreach, management recommendations, and development recommendations inside that actual city. So Arkansas joined this back in uh, July of 2020. The, uh, the first, that was the first uh, field season that all of this was launched. And um, this was done in collaboration with uh, the Game and Fish Commission. So this entire study spans sites in the Little Rock metro area you know, including Little Rock, North Little Rock, and Maumelle. And generally the overall objectives of the Central Arkansas Urban Wildlife Project are to um, discover species that occupy these urban green spaces in Central Arkansas. We also wanna see, you know, what environmental predictors are really promoting this wildlife occupancy. And then we also wanna use that to be able to make recommendations for how to manage all of these green spaces to make sure that both humans and wildlife are benefiting from them. Uh, we also wanna be able to, you know, connect all these local communities to the wildlife around them and then support these regional and even national studies of urban wildlife through the whole urban wildlife information network. So looking at, you know, generally where we're putting all of these cameras, we've placed 30 cameras along the Arkansas River in Little Rock. And these sites were selected based on the Urban Wildlife Information Network protocol, which calls for all of these sites to be about a kilometer apart. Um, we also wanted to place them within about two kilometers of the Arkansas River, um, seeing as this is one of the major um, ecological features of this area. So our sites run all the way from uh, Pinnacle Mountain over on the sort of northwest side of Little Rock, all the way down to David Terry Lock and Dam um, down on sort of the eastern side. And all of these field sites really occupy a lot of different types of um, environment. And so, you know, we can see things from uh, forested upland and lowlands. We have different uh, manicured sites, often in a lot of the parks and, you know, closer to central, Ar uh, central Little Rock. And um, we even have, you know, some of the wetlands that are, you know, really close to the uh, 
Arkansas River. And so for our data collection, we are running these cameras 24 seven for each month of January, April, July, and October, giving us you know, our winter, our spring, our summer, and our fall months. And during this time, all of these cameras are going the entire time and taking motion triggered photos at 30 second intervals. In the dark, they'll actually be taking infrared photos um, so that we can still you know, detect these species at nighttime. We don't wanna you know, only be able to see from you know, half, for half of the day. There's still so much questions we can ask about nighttime species. Um, so we wanna be able to capture every single you know, thing that we can see. So the cameras will be placed on a tree uh, each time that we go out and then we secure them with a strap and bike lock, you know, make sure that first of all, they're not gonna move and so that we can capture all of these photos but also that people are gonna come and take them. Um, then each of the cameras will be aimed at uh, like a Sintler in a pouch that'll be placed on a nearby tree. That way we can you know, uh, have the animals come in to check out the lure and we can get you know, good pictures of all of these animal, animals that will be in that area. Um, we'll go and we'll visit the cameras halfway through each month just to go check, uh, make sure the batteries aren't running out um, download any photos that we've gotten during that time, and also to ensure that the cameras haven't been messed with at all. Um, once we get all of these photos, they'll be tagged by uh, two team members. Each, each photo itself will be tagged by two different people and then validated by a third to try to ensure that we're getting, you know, as, as uh, specific as possible. And so then what can we do with these data? Well, there's a whole sorts of research questions that can be answered. Um, and really the potential is only just being realized. So here are a few examples of uh, some studies that actually have recently come out using this specific urban wildlife information network data. Um, a lot of researchers are looking at things like mammal diversity, behavior, and how uh, wealth and urbanization have influenced a lot of these variables. Um, so in Little Rock, we've now been operating for seven seasons. And now that we kind of have like our field, uh, field methods and such iron out, we're really starting to dig into the data. And this is you know, what this presentation is about. So we've got a couple specific examples that we're gonna go over today. Um, the first of which is going to be looking at um, how urbanization might influence the daily activity patterns of armadillos, and then the second of which will be going over the bird diversity, looking at them in uh, the different green spaces around Little Rock. All right, so armadillos, meaning little armored one in Spanish, are nocturnal mammals that are closely related to sloths and anteaters. An armadillo's shell is one of its best defense mechanisms. Um, there are actually reports of people who have been injured by bullets that have ricocheted off an armadillo's hard shell, which is crazy. Um, while there are about 20 different species of armadillos, only one species is found in the United States. This is the nine-banded armadillo. Uh, they're not native to Arkansas. It's presumed that they actually arrived in the state from Louisiana and Texas about 100 years ago, and their territory is continuously spreading north, a trend that is being exacerbated by climate change. Uh, armadillos, armadillos have a hard time regulating their body temperature, so they tend to avoid the hottest and coldest times of the day. To do this, they dig burrows that they will stay in for as long as 16 hours a day, um, and they're most active during the nighttime. Uh, armadillos prefer warm and wet climates with soft dirt that is easy to burrow in, uh, and populations of nine-banded armadillos have been increasing in recent years due to humans killing off many of their natural predators and also roadways allowing for easier migration to new habitats. However, this is also unfortunate because many armadillos are killed on highways due to cars. Uh, though they're small enough for cars to be able to pass over them, the nine-banded armadillos 
tendency is to jump straight up when they're frightened. And so they end up hitting the undercarriage of a passing vehicle, which leads to a fatal end. Um, the purpose of this study was to examine if the nine banded armadillo's daily activity was influenced by surrounding urbanization or land development. The study's design is based off of a similar study that was done recently in Fayetteville, which found that armadillos are actually changing their activity patterns to better avoid humans. While armadillos are mainly active at night, the study from Fayetteville found that armadillos were more likely to come out later in the night in areas that were more impacted by anthropogenic activity. Uh, in contrast, armadillos were actually more likely to be active in the daytime in areas that were less visited by humans. So uh, using the data collected from the Central Arkansas Urban Wildlife Project database, we first determined the total number of detections that were found at each site in the fall season of 2020, which is October, and the spring season of 2021, which was in April. Uh, every armadillo detection was scored as occurring either before or after sunset to determine if the activity was happening during the daytime or the nighttime. Uh, the time of sunset was calculated for each season using the sunset time for the 15th day of that month in order to account for changing day lengths across the year. Um, I used the time of the first armadillo sighting post sunset for every day in the season to assign the timing of activity of that specific day. So an armadillo that was first detected, the first armadillo that was detected, if it was detected one minute after sunset, it was given a value of one. And if an armadillo was first detected two hours after sunset, it would be given a value of 120. Uh, I removed all the armadillo detections that occurred before sunset or after sunrise. So that way I was only looking at the nocturnal activity. Uh, to understand how armadillo activity is influenced by human activity, we calculated multiple GIS variables of the surrounding 100 uh, meter radius around each camera site. The variables that were calculated to serve as proxies for human activity were the amount of developed land and also the amount of impermeable surface. However, uh, these two variables ended up having the same value, which meant that they were interchangeable metrics. So for ease of understanding, we calculated our results using the amount of developed land values. I then used a regression analysis to determine if there was a correlation between human activity and armadillo behavior. Uh, I also calculated uh, the p-value, which tells us just how significant these, difference, these differences are between groups. Uh, in general, we recorded 249 total armadillo detections across 17 camera sites for the fall season of 2020 and the spring season of 2021. The number of total armadillo detections per site ranged from one, which was found at multiple sites, to 40 detections, which was found at the um, David Terry Dam site in the east during the spring season of 2021. Uh, armadillo activity that we recorded was almost exclusively at night. Uh, I actually only found two diurnal detections that were recorded during the fall season of 2020. So here is a map showing the total number of armadillo detections in the fall season of 2020 for each camera site. Uh, the camera sites are along the Arkansas River in central Arkansas, and just to reorient ourselves, north of the river is the city of North Little Rock, and south of the, ri south of the river is Little Rock. Uh, the size of each circle is an indication of how many armadillo detections there were at each site. The larger the circles are indicates that there were more detections there, and the smaller circles means that there were less detections. Uh, the small black circles that you see means that there were no detections found at that site. As we can see, uh, armadillo detections are occurring all, all the way from the most western sites like Pinnacle Mountain to the most eastern sites like David T. Derry, David T. Terry Dam site. Um, we can see slightly more detections among the less developed areas, but this isn't consistent across the seasons that we studied. Uh, we're also seeing detections in all types of areas, including rural and more developed areas. 
meaning that there's not an apparent preference between environments. Uh, and these were the top sites that had the highest number of total detections for the fall season of 2020. So next, this is a map showing the total number of armadillo detections in the um, spring season of 2021 for each camera site. Uh, as you can see, the armadillo detections are still occurring all the way from the most western sites to the most eastern sites. Uh, the camera sites where we found armadillo detections in spring 2021 were not consistent with where we found detections in the fall season. However, we're still seeing detections in all types of areas on the rural to urban scale. So these were the top five sites with the highest number of total detections in the spring season of 2021. So these scatter plots show the correlation between the total amount of developed land and the total number of armadillos detected at each site. If you look along the horizontal axis, you'll see the scale for the total proportion of developed land. And if you look along the vertical axis, this is, the, this is where you see the total number of armadillo detections for that season. The graph on the left is the data for fall 2020, and the graph on the right is the data for spring 2021. And our statistical analysis showed that there was not a significant correlation between these two variables for either season. Uh, okay, so these scatter plots show the correlation between the total proportion of developed land and the time of the first armadillo detection post post sunset at each site. Uh, these graphs also show the total amount of developed land on the horizontal axis for the seasons fall 2020 and spring 2021, except now the vertical axis, we are seeing the time of the first armadillo detection that happened post sunset at each camera site. Uh, again, our statistical analyses showed that there wasn't a significant correlation between these two variables for either season. Now, what are the key takeaways from this study? Uh, assuming that our armadillo detections are accurate, we found that the amount of developed land for each site didn't affect the total number of armadillo detections or the timing of the first armadillo detection post sunset. This seems to indicate that the armadillos just don't care about our method of urbanization. But seriously, these results did not meet our, ex our expectations based on prior research though there are a couple explanations for why this may be. Uh, first, it's possible that there are other variables that distinguish our study from the one that was done at UA. Uh, one could be the level and distribution of forest fragmentation. While we calculated our results based on the proportion of developed land as the human proxy, the study done in Fayetteville used a level of anthropogenic noise and the distance to the nearest human population center as their human proxy. Uh, so it could be that these variables are not well controlled for between these two studies and they should be controlled for in further research. Um, it's also a possibility that this study was affected by armadillo activity around a river body. Uh, the study done in Fayetteville took place at 10 sites that were located in forested areas while our study was along the Arkansas River and it also covered a much larger range of environmental variability. So further research into this could give insight into how urbanization affects armadillo activity in different types of ecosystems. The study had a couple limitations. First, we only looked at one metric for human activity when there are multiple ways we could measure human activity. Uh, for instance, we could have also looked at forest cover or the actual physical level of human activity, activity that was happening at each site or we could also look at the availability of food resources for each site. Uh, the study also shows just a snapshot of time as opposed to showing armadillo activity over the course of a longer time period. Uh, doing the study over multiple years would yield probably more reliable results and perhaps even reveal some novel information that we didn't see in this study. Uh, but overall, by doing this research, we get closer to understanding how we can better cohabitate with the wildlife around us and make living easier for all of us, regardless of species. All right, so birds are an interesting topic 
because we see this fluctuation of population and species diversity due to some species, you know, migrating for winter and then coming back in the summer. So Little Rock really has a wide diversity of bird species um, from, you know, the summer songbird species that we see to, you know, residential populations of raptor species. Um, in previous studies, we've often seen urban green spaces providing a really beneficial role in being able to maintain species diversity inside um, higher urban areas um, compared to the rural areas nearby. Whereas we typically see in areas of higher development, uh, you get a bit of a decrease in diversity um, due to you know, certain species, especially generalist uh, bird species, um, tending to become uh, more dominant over the other species. Um, and this is really an important uh, point as it can be sort of a determining factor on the species diversity. When you find a higher abundance of a couple specific species over, you know, a general um, evenness of the species diversity that you'll see um, in, you know, areas when you get a lot more migration species coming in. So, this doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that abundance will go down per se. It just means that we'll see a shift in species diversity. So the purpose of this study was to evaluate the bird abundance and species richness or species diversity at each site in comparison to both developed land and forest cover to gain an idea about the effectiveness of our urban green spaces. By using development, uh, developed land cover and forest cover for each of our sites, that can give us a little bit of a better idea about how uh, these urban green spaces are being utilized and if it's actually providing a benefit to these bird species. So now, how did I go about doing this? Well, first I had to go find all of our bird detections because we do have quite a lot of them. So I needed to go and isolate every bird that we've gotten so far along with the date and time of every, you know, detection that we had uh, in our, you know, corresponding database. The reason I made the choice to go over every single detection instead of maybe, um, you know, one specific season or only, you know, a couple months or something like that is that overall, there wasn't a major difference when I looked at maybe just spring and summer compared to fall, you would get a similar species richness, but you know, your composition might change. I decided that I wanted to be able to have much bigger data set and be able to evaluate everything more than less data and maybe just, um, you know, a couple more species. All this to say, there really just was no noticeable difference in using just, you know, like the summer or something like that. Plus, we also only have two summer data sets. And so I just really wanted to be able, be able to have a more encompassing data set to work with. Um, so with this information, it really gave me several step off points to go from. So I was able to first get the number of detections that every species had. Um, and then look at the species richness actually at each site, um, along with the number of detections per site. Um, so this can give us some good information about what sites had, you know, good amounts of productivity and are benefiting bird species, um, and which may not be providing those same benefits. Going even further, uh, we use the uh, national land cover data to be able to estimate uh, the proportion of each site um, that would be developed land or forested cover, which we could use as a proxy for green space. And so, you know, if we see more developed land in an area, we could think of that as a more, you know, developed urbanized area compared to a more forested area. We could think of that as, you know, more of a urban green space. So in this way, we would be able to see you know, the impact of these green spaces on Little Rock's bird populations. So 
what kind of birds were we saying? Well, for our top birds, the number one bird by far was the American robin, uh, which had three times higher detections than just the second bird on the list, being the brown thrasher. So robins were detected a total of 1,575 times, um, which is a lot compared to some of the birds, you know, I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, so then after that, you know, we had the brown thrasher, we had the northern cardinal, white-throated sparrow, and blue jay. So you can see uh, one of the American robins pictured below on one of our cameras. This is, you know, something we would often see when we were tagging. Um, and this is, you know, a species we all came to be very, very familiar with. Now, when we start looking at some of our rarer birds, every single bird on this list was only ever recorded once. So um, looking at the, our, the number one bird on that list, the wood thrush, that picture that you see there at the bottom is the only detection that we had of a wood thrush um, out of the seven seasons that we've been going so far. So um, as we sort of move into more of the results, um, just sort of keep these birds in mind um, and it might help to sort of explain some of the trends we might, uh, you might start seeing. So we're gonna look at some maps again, um, just to reorient you. Um, this one has to do with uh, specifically detections. So each of these um, orange circles are a site that we have going along the Arkansas River. And the number inside is gonna be how many total detections of birds we saw at that site. And so the top sites that we tended to see just detection wise are Terry Mansion Park, East End Park, Murray Park, Sherman Park, and the Riverfront Park. Generally, our sort of areas are uh, like sort of the hot spots are the Murray Park, the Burns area, and sort of, you know, central Little Rock, um, and, you know, sort of south Little Rock, west, west, that kind of area. And then our real main area was the Riverfront area where we saw a huge number of uh, bird detections at those sites. Um, and, you know, many of these areas weren't even just popular with birds, but, you know, lots of other animals that we detected as well. And so when we look at species diversity, we see a lot of the same trends. Um, again, you know, that uh, Murray Park, Burns Park area is very popular. And again, the riverfront areas, another area of, you know, a huge amount of diversity, um, just looking at all of these different species that we're seeing, um, you know, up to 23 species at just one site. And so now it's time to talk about forest cover. So when looking at the results concerning our forest cover, we actually saw that only species richness will actually decrease with increasing forest cover. So that means we're actually seeing less species the more forested the area is. Um, we did not see a significant result um, on just the total amount of detections. Um, but we did see this significant downward trend with the species richness or the species diversity. This was contrary to what we expected. Uh, we did expect that, you know, it would go up and seeing that this was used as sort of a proxy for uh, green space. And so when we looked at develop land, so if we see, you know, it's gonna go down as we increase in forested area, it makes sense then that as we look at developed land, that's gonna be, uh, our proportion is gonna be on the horizontal axis again this time, both detections and species richness uh, increased with the amount of developed land that we had. Now, granted, there were some sites that had a large amount of detections, uh, an absurdly <laughs> large amount of detections and species richness. Um, but both of these, the detections and species richness, both increased with developing land, which was really interesting and something we did not expect. And so sort of the key takeaways from 
all of this is that, uh, first of all, overall um, bird detections and species richness increased with developed areas and then decreased with more forested areas. Um, again, you know, contrary to what we had expected into some of the previous findings. Um, however, like previous findings though, we still are seeing um, some species uh, more dominant in these areas than others. So like I'd mentioned before, um, American robins were extremely common. Brown thrashers were extremely common. Whereas, um, you know, some other songbirds were not quite as common. And so we're seeing a higher abundance of some specific species. And, um, but we still are seeing an increase of richness with uh, developed land, which uh, took a little bit of thinking to kind of work through. And so this could be for uh, multiple reasons. So one thing to think about is the areas of increased diversity. So I'm thinking, you know, like kind of the riverfront area, maybe the Murray Burns Park area, um, probably have a lot more environmental variation than we had expected. Um, thinking about it, you know, you've got the waterfront areas, you've got backyard areas, you've got, you know, manicured parks, you've got forested areas. There's all sorts of different place for these birds to really be able to take advantage of. And, you know, even though a lot of them might be in pretty developed areas, these birds are still really able to take advantage of all of these different places and, you know, being able to fly, they can really move around and that can, you know, help them a lot. Um, another thing to think about is uh, we might have also caught a lot of birds on our cameras for certain reasons like, you know, foraging behavior. Um, two of our most extremely common birds, you know, robins and brown thrashers tend to like to, you know, forage around on the ground. And so they might have been caught by uh, our cameras a lot more because of that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, really sort of increase their detections. Um, as well as uh, these are also residential species versus migratory species. And so these residential species might have come up a lot more often because they're gonna be here year round compared to some of the migratory species that we didn't catch, you know, quite as often. Um, you know, things like the summer tanager and the wood thrush that we had seen in the list before. So we'll need more data to be able uh, to be collected to really evaluate, you know, a difference between, you know, migratory and non-migratory and the, um, you know, residential species um, before we can really gain, you know, a better idea. Uh, we essentially really only have like one spring and summer season worth of sort of usable data during the first uh, summer. Um, the tagging was not taken quite as seriously. And so some of the species may not have been identified either correctly or may not have been identified like all the way down the species level. Um, and this really is a limitation of the study as you know, although some of them may not have been identified, it also can be kind of hard, you know, if you get a cam, you know, a picture with a bad angle of the bird or it flies really quickly through the picture, it can be hard to tell what that bird is. And so we might not have you know, amazing parameters of exactly what sort of diversity that we're seeing, because maybe we missed certain species that had shown up in the cameras, but we just, you know, weren't able to identify them correctly. Um, and so, you know, to help with this, we've, you know, really begun trying to implement a lot more resources with, um, you know, pictures and doing a bit more uh, training on, you know, tagging these birds and being able to really identify them much better than before. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, we did not have very much data during these migratory species, uh, when the time the migratory species were in Little Rock. So this lack of knowledge on this diversity, um, you know, really didn't exactly help to be able to figure out exactly what might be going on. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention too about limitations is just camera placement. And so, you know, there could be reasons. So 
Terry Mansion Park, I keep bringing it up, but it was our real heavy hitter uh, site for bird species. And so it could have been, you know, camera placement. That was the reason we saw so many detections of certain birds. That one had like a lot of leaf litter and that sort of thing. And so insectivores and generalists, you know, might keep showing up at that spot because it provides a much better access to, you know, food sources and such. So these are just a couple of the ways that this data can be used to ask questions about how wildlife use green spaces around Little Rock. Anyone that uses green spaces in Little Rock would know that there is wildlife that coexists in these spaces, but this is the first study to document these, this wildlife systematically and to also take count of which species occur in the green spaces in central Arkansas. Uh, we've already determined that species richness is considerable in these parks, so this data can help us to think about ways in which humans and wildlife can coexist and improve interactions in these areas. Uh, also, many of the species that we've detected provide crucial ecosystem services, such as pest control, seed dispersal, and opportunities to watch wildlife and thus their value is greater than a simple biodiversity metric. Uh, here are some example pictures on the side. The top one shows a gray fox that's carrying its prey at one of our sites. And the bottom picture is a gray squirrel that is presumably uh, caching a nut. These data can help us determine the directions in which we should take management in green spaces. Uh, we can hopefully find ways to manage parks with both humans and wildlife in mind. For example, this research can be used to direct beautification projects of urban spaces through the planting of native species. Uh, we can also use this data to guide increasing connectivity between parks and further help facilitate the dispersal of wildlife between parks. Um, and lastly, this data can be used in outreach to help citizens learn more about the wildlife around them and what they can do to help support these animals. In the future, we can explore different variables such as the size of the green space, uh, level of urbanization and connectivity and see how these variables determine wildlife occupancy, species richness and diversity. Uh, additionally, based on the fact that we run our cameras in all four seasons, uh, we can look at seasonal effects on wildlife occupancy and track yearly changes. We hope to use these data ultimately to develop outreach and education materials for the public and hopefully help citizens of the Little Rock area to see that while there is wildlife in the areas in which they play, they can happily coexist. So I just want to say a quick thank you to everyone who has made this project possible. This has been a huge collaborative effort, and we really are thankful for everyone's hard work and cooperation. And we will close with some shots of other critters that have graced our cameras. Uh, from left to right, you see a raccoon, a turtle, a red fox, and then the bottom row is a woodchuck, a white-tailed deer, and also a bobcat. So um, are there any questions? I think I saw some in the um, chat. Yeah, thanks everyone. And, uh, as a reminder, if you have a question, you can either type it in the chat or you can take yourself off mute and ask a question. Um, I'll start with uh, some of the chat questions here. Could you... Uh, Please comment on the diet of armadillos. Yeah, so um, armadillos are considered uh, generalist feeders. They're not really picky about what they eat, um, but they mostly feed on small invertebrates such as like beetles, uh, cockroaches, scorpions, spiders, snails, and such. Uh, they also feed on plants and uh, carrion as well. And uh, another question from the chat is, is, a, is your species identification done through artificial intelligence or by you, the researchers? Um, yeah, did you want to answer? 
Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, so our identification process is done uh, by us researchers. We have an identification program where we'll go through each of the photos that were taken and we'll actually tag what we identify in the photos. And then that goes through a validation process to make sure that we're de detecting the right species. Yeah, usually, for example, it would be, you know, say, um, Ariane and I are a team, we would get one photo uh, sent to the both of us, we would both tag it. And then, you know, we would send it to somebody like Dr. McClung, who would then verify to say, oh, you know, yes, you got it right, or something like that. Related to that, I was thinking that even if you had an unidentified bird that was just zipping through, there might still be some value saying bird spa or songbird spa species that some analyses could at least make use of the fact that there was a songbird there or there was a rodent of some kind there. Yeah, so when I was doing all of my, uh, you know, data collection and such, so if you, you know, I, I used detections and I used the uh, indicators of species diversity. So detections, we do have some actual, like just sort of, you know, bird spa sort of, uh, and, you know, all encompassing uh, general bird uh, detections. Those were used in uh, the amount of detections that we actually got, but not used in the actual species diversity we got, because I wanted to be able to indicate, you know, we specifically know what, you know, species these are and can give a more accurate indication of that, um, that species diversity. Makes sense. Does anyone else want to take themselves off mute and ask a question? Yes, please. Go on, John. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> okay, as I indicated in the preface to this wonderful presentation, is there, are any of the cameras live webcams for 24 seven, not for the general public to interfere or comment, but just to be part of the general viewing audience for want of a better expression? So they are not. Um, they are in, they only take individual photos and they do that every 30 seconds. We've got like a, a no little, um, we have a little card, you know, that we can take out and we can download each picture, but it's not live or anything like that. It'll record and save every single picture. Yeah, I wondered if, if at the sites that you have been doing the professional monitoring of, there also just happened to be um, I know there are several cameras on the lock and dam, and I'm wondering whether they in any way, shape or form match your view, your professional view as to what you want to be looking at, as opposed to maybe barge traffic or Joe Blow going up on his speedboat to go fishing. There is no corroboration. You're not aware of live webcams. The other reason I ask that is that those places that have live webcams that are well known, obviously the Alaskas, the beaches, the owls, et cetera, et cetera, get mm -hmm. very large audiences of participation by people. Yeah, so we, we only typically have these cameras and, you know, like, especially when you're thinking of, you know, like the dam area and like, you know, pretty wooded areas. We never really have it facing, you know, out into, or we rarely do have them facing out into areas of, you know, high traffic. Um, <laughs> we did, we, we did actually have one right on the riverfront that then was encased uh, in a whole area of construction. And so we had a whole bunch of construction workers going through uh, and past our camera for uh you know a good couple weeks um until we were like okay we've we've got to move this um so you know we're not going to typically see a lot of those people coming through um we're only going to see these very like you know enclosed wooded areas okay uh, i suspect the live streaming camera would require a lot more 
technology more, you know, it's, it's a different type of camera. They got to have batteries. You got to have the ability to transmit the data live. It's a whole different oh, yeah. setup than yeah. just putting out some trail mm -hmm. cameras that pick up wildlife when, when something moves through the field of view. Oh yeah, and then it occur I, completely. I would suspect for this kind of viewing, it would largely be boring with nothing going on except for <laughs> on rare occasions, oh. something passing through, right? It's not like you're setting it up on a nest where the pair is constantly at the nest feeding young. Yeah, well, and if you think about it too, we, like, you know, um, like Arian had mentioned, we do all of this ourselves. So we go through and we tag each photo. So that's also why we have it on a 30 second timer. So we're not getting an, you know, an inane amount of squirrels running through caching nuts, <laughs> um, you know, during the fall and winter months. We still get an inane amount of squirrels. It's squirrels are the bane of our existence. I like to send out reminders to my students when it's National Squirrel Day that happy squirrel day, because <laughs> it's pretty rough. I wanted to ask you, um, Arian Keen, I don't think I've ever asked you this. Is there like a, a favorite photo or like a maybe most interesting photo you've come across where you were like, wow, that's cool, or oh my gosh, that's amazing? Do you want to go first, Arian? What do you mean? I'm trying. I'm trying to think of some. Uh, so, well, yeah, so here I can go while you're thinking. <laughs> um, mine actually was, I was going through um, a lot of these, like you know, very like one-off bird cases where we only had one detection, and I actually found a uh, an old picture of a great horned owl that we'd gotten at one of the. Um, parks in the Burns area or one of our sites in the Burns Park area which was really cool because like it wasn't the greatest photo but it was still like you could really make out what it was and it almost looked like you know it was hunting and um I just thought that was a super cool photo because you know you think about you know you find so many squirrels and you find you know all these possums and raccoons and you know robins and such and here's this great horned owl uh you know flying in the darkness that's a lucky shot you got there. Yeah. Hey Dan, okay. I've got a, a comment if it's okay. Uh, sure. It's Karen Holiday. Hey Karen. Um, I live in Maumel. I live on the backside of Lake Williston, and my husband runs a game camera all the time. And um, it's infrared, so we see this, you know stuff at night. We're amazed at everything we get in our backyard from a herd of deer almost every night to raccoons, possums, rabbits, red fox, you name it. And our newest visit the other night was a coyote. So it, there, and I had no idea that rabbits are active at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but it's, it's amazing what comes through our, our backyard. Yeah, I actually, one of my neighbors um, back home in Austin, Texas recently had set up a game camera and I, I, I live in a fairly urban area um, and they recently started getting a gray fox showing up on their doorstep like every other night. Um, and it, you know, every so often my, you know, parents will send me pictures of it. Um, and it's just incredible, you know, because like I said, it's it's a fairly like urban area in North Austin. So, you know, you often won't expect things to show up, but they do. Our red fox comes and actually looks at the camera. <laughs> we'll catch him with his face in the camera sometimes. Have you ever had a camera stolen? Um, we've definitely oh. had cameras tampered with. I'm not sure. Have we had cameras stolen? We haven't, we haven't had any physically taken, but there was one park, which shall remain nameless, where um, it was vandalized to, to where it couldn't be used anymore twice. And so we ended up just having to move. And I, I think that brings up an interesting point. Um, you know, we're very focused on the wildlife, but we have to remember we're living among a community in this project. And um, 
So in, at the outset of this, our partner, Kristen Bartlow in particular, and another woman who was on the project, Ashley Gramza, were really amazing at reaching out to communities and making sure they were aware who we were, what we were doing. We, we got their feedback, right? And um, even visit, visited some of their community meetings um, just to really try to kind of establish that, that bond that, you know, we weren't here to spy because as you can imagine, people might that might be something that makes them nervous, right? A camera in their neighborhood. Um, and so, you know, for the most part, we've had really good luck. Um, you may encounter some of these cameras. If you if you see any of them, there's a little QR code tag that you can actually take a picture of with your phone and it'll take you to our website. Um, you know, throw up a peace sign at us if you ever see any of them and we'll be happy to, to see your smiling faces. Um question I have is about the methodology and is the um, the methodology th this urban wildlife information network put out there is it just game cameras or do they offer all sorts of things because I see that the game camera is really biased towards medium to large mammals and bird you know terrestrial birds that forage on the ground and it's not necessarily the best way to get at all the urban wildlife you're missing the rodents and the voles and the bats and the birds that stay up in the trees all the time so do they have other methodologies to help to suggest for surveying wildlife you just chose this one particular for your research project I might be able to speak to that more than than Ari and Keen because I've I've been on this since it started in 20, if y'all don't mind. Um, so we meet quarterly with our partners from UN. And um it all started with just game cameras, real mammal focus, but they as they've grown, they are planning on branching out. In fact, they've piloted a program for audio moths. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They're acoustic recording devices that you set out and they are targeted towards like acoustically communicating species like birds and um, amphibians. And so um, as you can imagine, this is a really big operation. Um, there's a lot of people involved. It's it's nonstop. If we're not having a field season, we're tagging photos. Um, and so we're still kind of finding our, our footing and making sure that we can handle the workload. And um, I wanted to give a shout out. I saw Meredith is here, Meredith, um, uh, uh, just joined our team recently. I don't know if she's still on. I saw her on the call call earlier. Um, uh, she's a, from Game and Fish. And um, we have talked about potentially in the future, uh, including some audio moth detectors, because uh, you know, as someone who studies acoustics and loves birds, I certainly am really interested in that. But it might take an extra level of effort that we sort of need to make sure we can handle before we commit to that. But um, that is, for the most part, the sort of two mechanisms UN uses right now. And um, that map uh, they included in the presentation is actually a little outdated. We've now gone international. So there are um, folks in Germany and South Africa that have launched UN protocol sites. And um, there's been some growing pains, but it's pretty amazing. It's starting to have outreach internationally, this, this whole protocol. Very good. Any other questions before we finish up? One quickie. Since you've been doing this over a number of years, with the <clears throat> increase in urbanization, and therefore presumably human nature being what it is, the increase in non-local plants, in other words, fruit and veg that were not always here, have you? what have you noticed in the way of wildlife adapting to still being able to keep on feeding which then draws me to wonder how important is a continuation of planting native plants native trees etc i'm not going to do this one this one's for the students I'll let you guys think think about that good question yeah <laughs> Um, I, I, I would say, I think the project is, um, still in its, like, 
diapers like still new enough where we're not really seeing a difference in like when we first started as opposed to now in like urbanization levels. Um, but I don't know. Um, I usually just see a lot of squirrels catching nuts. I think that's the most uh, food I see on the cameras. Yeah, you know, the, the plant life has really been quite consistent um, over, you know, the, a lot of the time that we've been doing this. And so uh, just at this point, it's, it's a little hard to be able to quite tell um, if, you know, anything is really having an impact. Um, okay. So, you know, you can certainly see maybe some of the vegetation in certain areas, like, is more conducive, you know, we'll have deer populations that pop up in a lot of similar sites, you know, especially like places like Pinnacle Mountain that maybe have slightly more native plants than others. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, again, like this is a new project. So it's still, it can be a little hard to tell about how these sort of vegetation are really having a major impact or not. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. And that, as this project grows over the years, uh, Dr. McClung, I'm thinking, what, how does urban wildlife compare as you go away from a river corridor, you go from the Arkansas River into a fully on, full on urbanized area, but then how does it compare when you get to the next uh, creek corridor, like Fush Creek, Little Rock's main waterway? Um, is there a gradation of wildlife diversity from river corridor to river corridor? Yeah, no, that's a good point. So um, some of the cities, like especially Chicago, where this started, and I, I feel terrible. I don't even know the first year they launched. Um, I know it's been at least six years. Uh, they actually have three transects or maybe even more at this point that they run that kind of radiate out from the city center away from the lake front. Um, and there are other cities that have multiple transects. Again, we are not in a place where we can manage that because it is, it is considerable work to get this done. Um, but that, that is something that's sort of on the table as well, right? Do we add another transect that isn't just along the river, um, that, but that also extends out like either south or north, um, whatever direction it needs to go? Because I, I think we would see different things. I mean, I think Keen might have alluded to this or mentioned this when he was talking about just, you know, the fact that we're next to a river for most of our sites, we've got, you know, a, a variety of habitats. Um, you know, think about like the, I can't remember the name of the island across from the Clinton Public Library, but that's its own thing. And then you've got, um, you know, places like uh, Rebsamen Golf Course and um, Cook's Landing. And, you know, these places are all pretty close to water, right? And it's not like they're super consistent, but there's there's something that unites them. Whereas if you're moving away from the river, you're gonna get a lot, probably more dramatic change in some ways. So if you wanna assemble a team from Audubon <laughs> of like, we need about, I don't know, 10 people on your team <laughs> at all times, let's talk. Audubon has done some camera traps over the years especially along Bush Creek as part of our biodiversity studies of Bush Creek. Uh, but um, we're, we're about out of time here, but just to, to paraphrase two of the sentiments that came over chat, um, I think all of us who are urban residents can see that wildlife habitats being chipped away one development at a time, one shopping mall at a time. And while each development alone doesn't seem like much, it is adding up and I hope that some of the results of this study over time can help us help the city make more informed decisions about green spaces and wildlife corridors and replacing some of the habitat that's lost. And of course, I'll put a plug in for all of us homeowners. We have a role to play by planting native plants in our yard, making our yards, the environment we can control, safer and healthier for birds and other wildlife. Amen. Yeah, amen. So thank you everyone for tuning into our meeting. Um, we're going to go into the business portion of our meeting. And uh, thank you, uh, Ariane and Keen, for presenting your research. Very fascinating. Always great to see undergraduates doing research and taking opportunities to do public presentation and great 
uh, effort tag teaming tonight. I appreciate it. Good job. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Yes.